Welcome back to the Hardware Unboxed News Corner in a special time slot this week on a Monday. Normally, of course, we release these episodes on a Friday, but last Friday was the NVIDIA RTX unboxing and Turing technical info embargo, so we pushed News Corner out to Monday. Also, as a heads up, there won't be a News Corner this coming Friday either, as we'll be pumping out GeForce RTX follow-up content at that point. Another quick note, because I know some of you will otherwise ask about it. Yes, we have seen the RTX 2080 and RTX 2080 Ti performance information from video cards, which was allegedly sourced from the reviewer's guide. Because we're testing the cards right now, we can't talk about performance or comment on those numbers. If you want to see our performance figures from a wider range of games using more resolutions, you'll have to wait for our day one coverage on Wednesday, and trust me, it will be worth it. But there is some new NVIDIA RTX news that we can share with you, a forum post on the official GeForce forums has revealed a slight delay to GeForce RTX 2080 Ti general availability. The card was supposed to officially become available on September 20th, but there has now been a one week delay pushing that availability back to September 27th. Nvidia says pre-orders should arrive between the 20th and 27th. The RTX 2080 will still be available on September 20th as planned, and there is no change to when we can talk about performance so you'll still get to hear how the 2080 Ti performs in just a few days. NVIDIA didn't give any reason for the delay, perhaps the same issue caused our RTX 2080 Ti sample to ship out later than the 2080 sample. Who knows? Uh, in any case, we still expect availability to be very limited on the 20th and 27th for these cards. Pre-orders are sold out basically everywhere and I can't see there being a huge amount of stock available on launch day. On top of that, Pricing will likely remain well above the AIB MSRP for at least a, a long while, I reckon. The other NVIDIA story of this past week is certainly less interesting. The company announced a further nine games will support their Deep Learning Super Sampling, or DLSS, technology, including Darksiders 3 and Hellblade Senua's Sacrifice. These games join other titles like Shadow of the Tomb Raider, Hitman 2, and PUBG. As a quick note, I've heard a lot of chatter wondering what exactly is DLSS? NVIDIA has done you guys absolutely no favors calling it a super sampling technique while also pointing to the supposed performance benefits of DLSS. As I'm sure you're aware, super sampling usually comes at a performance cost, not at a performance gain when enabled. So to clear everything up, there are two DLSS modes. The standard mode is simply called DLSS, and that renders the game at a lower than native resolution. NVIDIA says the actual resolution is around two times lower, but it varies depending on the game's implementation. So when you have a game running at 4K with DLSS enabled, the game is actually being rendered below 4K. DLSS then uses an AI network trained on a 64x super sample anti-aliased version of the game to reconstruct the image back to a 4K presentation. You can sort of think of this DLSS method like a potentially superior version of checkerboard rendering or temporal rendering, techniques used with consoles to play games at 4K while actually rendering the game at a lower resolution. NVIDIA confusingly compares DLSS to TAA or temporal anti-aliasing in their slides. TAA is usually applied to a game running at a native resolution to provide basic anti-aliasing, but I assume for these comparisons NVIDIA is talking about running at a sub-native resolution then using TAA to upscale. Personally, the more interesting DLSS mode is called DLSS 2X, which does not run the game at a sub-native resolution. Instead, DLSS 2X is more like a traditional anti-aliasing technique. It runs the game at a native resolution, then uses the AI network to try and clean up the image to match 64 times super sample anti-aliasing. So in theory, this could be a low-cost AA method like SMAA or FXAA, but instead of using basic processing techniques or just straight up blurring the image, it's using the AI network to neatly clean up jagged edges or other artifacts. We'll have a full look into DLSS a bit later, but it certainly sounds quite interesting. This next story is an interesting one if true. A report from the ever unreliable DigiTimes has suggested Intel is at capacity with their 14 nanometer fabs and to meet the demands of their customers has had to offload some chip production to TSMC on their equivalent node. At this stage Intel is set to offload H310 production and several other 300 series chipsets to their rival fab. In a statement to PC Games N, Intel didn't exactly deny the rumors but did say that in response to the stronger than expected demand environment, we are continuing to invest in Intel's 14 nanometer manufacturing capacity. That could mean Intel are going to solely use their own 14 nanometer fabs for 14 nanometer products, 
or it could mean they will indeed be offloading chips to TSMC while they invest and improve their 14 nanometer capacity. There has been some speculation as to why Intel has allegedly had to move some chips to TSMC or why their 14 nanometer fabs are at capacity. The obvious candidate for jokes is Intel continues to release so many 14 nanometer plus 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 processors but usually at each release, Intel would ramp down manufacturing of their old chips to ramp up production of new ones. The best guess I've heard is Intel are providing their latest modem to Apple for use in their new iPhones. And this new modem is produced on a 14 nanometer process while previous modems used older nodes. So to produce enough modems for Apple on 14 nanometer, they had to ditch some other less important stuff and push it to TSMC. That's just a guess though, I doubt we'll ever know for sure. Last week, AMD announced the Ryzen 3 2300X and Ryzen 5 2500X to very little fanfare, and that's for one reason. These new lower tier Zen Plus processors are for OEMs only for the time being. This struck us as a bit strange, as there probably would have been demand for the 2300X and 2500X among system builders, but regardless, they have actually launched officially now after a few months of rumors. The two CPUs, they're quite basic. The Ryzen 3 2300X is a four core, four thread Zen Plus CPU clocked at 3.5 gigahertz base with a 4.0 gigahertz turbo. The Ryzen 5 2500X includes SMT, so it has four cores and eight threads, but it's clocked around the same at a 3.6 gigahertz base and 4.0 gigahertz turbo. Both chips have eight megabytes of level three cache and a 65 watt TDP. I suspect AMD aren't selling these to consumers because they feel the Ryzen 3 2200G and Ryzen 5 2400G already do what the 2300X and 2500X do while also providing the benefit of integrated Vega graphics. After all, the 2400G, for example, is only clocked slightly lower than the 2500X, but it also packs in 11 Vega compute units. The 2500X would only make sense as a cheaper CPU than the 2400G, and maybe AMD doesn't want to do that. Not really sure, but at least for the time being, we won't be seeing those new CPUs uh, available for consumers. Final news topic of this week, AOC has launched a new series of affordable G1 gaming monitors. There are four monitors all up, three of which are basic 1080p models in 24 inch, 27 inch and 31.5 inch sizes. And the fourth is a 31.5 inch 1440p model. All of these displays pack 144 Hz maximum refresh rates with FreeSync support and all use curved VA panels of either 1800R for the larger models or 1500R for the 24 inch model. Aside from those basic specs, not a lot to discuss. It's all basic VA display specs, including 3000 to one contrast ratios, 250 nits of maximum brightness, sRGB color gamuts and one millisecond MPRT response times, uh, which no doubt will be nowhere near one millisecond in practice. The 27 inch 1080p G1 monitor is available now for $280 and I've put in a request with AOC to review it. So that should be sent out soon. So stay tuned for that. The other models will be available in Q4 at prices of $230 for the 1080p 144Hz model, which I think is actually quite a good price for those specs and a VA panel. Uh, it'll be $300 for the 32 inch 1080p and $400 for the 32 inch 1440p. All right, that's it for this week's News Corner. Subscribe to get this segment in your inbox every Friday. I guess, except for the times we don't do that and publish it on a Monday instead. Consider supporting us on Patreon to get access to our exclusive Discord chat. And of course, look out for our coverage of NVIDIA's RTX cards starting on Wednesday with actual performance information. That's it. I'll catch you next time.